Day Worship Center of Seventh-day Adventists here in New York City. Oh, it's a joy to welcome God's people, those who are here in the congregation and those who are watching online around the world. We want to welcome you to Sabbath School Community Worship Center. At this point in our lesson we study, uh, we review our Sabbath School lesson. We take another look at what we have studied this week, and I hope we are all studying our Sabbath School lesson. Not just reading, but studying the lesson. When we are finished in the book of Hebrews, oh, you will be proficient in Bible study. Because Hebrew takes us very deep in the scriptures. And that's where we are this quarter. We're studying the book of Hebrews. Today we look at the caption, Jesus, author and perfecter of our faith. Jesus author and perfecter of our faith. Our memory verse is taken from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the New King James Version, and let's say that together. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Our dear Father, thank you so much for entrusting us with the Bible. Thank you, Lord, for these precious gems that we have uncovered this week as we study. We ask you now, Lord, that you would come by. Bring them back to our minds as we review today. Bless us as we study your word. We ask now in the precious name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen and amen. Here to discuss with us, Elder Samuel is over there, one of the elders here at our, at our church. And to my right, we have uh, Pastor David Willis and also Brother Doyle to the far end here to discuss with us God's word today. Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. It takes a lot of faith to please God. And if we are to be saved, faith is a quality that we must have. If we are to be saved in God's kingdom, faith is a quality we must have. Jesus once asked the question to those listening to him. He says, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith in the earth? That's Luke 18 and verse 8. When Jesus comes again, will he find faith in the earth? You think he will? Faith. What's the other word for faith? Belief. You've got, there's a lot of things we don't see. And if you believe them based on the, the facts, blessed are you. You need all of that. You have never seen God, and you will never see him. When we are saved, we will see him. The Bible says we shall see him face to face. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. But uh, from creation until now, we have not seen God. But Jesus says, if you see me, you see the Father. And so, faith is a quality that is highly necessary for our salvation. We see in our lesson this week, Hebrews chapter 11, God exhibits his hall of fame in Hebrews chapter 11. Giants of faith. God told the writer of the book of Hebrews, put them in my hall of fame. Put them there. 
And if, if it were you writing that book, that exhibition of God's Hall of Fame, there are some names you wouldn't put there. That is in there. Huh? Some names you, like who? Rahab? You wouldn't put Rahab's name there? Why? The elder says in the congregation, she's no good. But you know something, no pastor? She's in God's, in Jesus' family tree. Yes, bless the Lord. <laughs> bless the Lord. Rahab the harlot. Not only, is she in, not only is she in God's Hall of Fame, but she's in the lineage of Jesus. That's right. Jesus came through Rahab the harlot. What a God. There's another name that I don't know if I would put there. Samson. Samson, somebody says over there. Would you put Samson in God's Hall of Fame? Kill all of those people? Kill himself? Well, the Bible says if you kill yourself, you can't be saved. Thou shalt not kill. And yet he killed so many people, and he's in God's hall of fame. The elder says he wouldn't put Achan in there, but let's, get, let's, let's finish with Samson here first. <laughs> Have mercy. What is he doing there? In God's hall of fame. Oh, you know, Samson was born for a purpose. And do you think Samson was the one who pushed down those walls? Do you think any man could do that? No, no. Who did it? It was God. So don't blame Samson. Yeah, don't mess with him. Yes, sir. <laughs> Brothers, I don't mess with him. But God, Samson came for a purpose to fix those people. You know, Pastor, he came through when he, when he was needed to come through. Mm. When he no longer had eyes to see. And he trusted God. In fact, he, in, in his one last act, he killed more Philistines than he did when he was a judge in Israel. Ah, bless the Lord. And so he did what the Lord instructed him to do. And the Lord used them to do something, and we will see Samson in the kingdom of God. He's now exhibited in God's hall of fame. And the other guy you say you wouldn't put there? He wouldn't put Achan in there, that crook. Huh? Sit on those quotes when he should have exhibited them and uh, exalted the name of God. Because he brought, he brought a black eye on God's program. And yet he is in God's hall of fame. Why? The elder said, God is merciful. Merciful, long-suffering. There was a purpose. Wonderful thing about it when we turn away from wrong and sin. And the Lord forgive us. It is like we have never done anything in the past. Amen. That's the kind of God we serve. And there is a man in the God's Hall of Fame which our lesson says, top them all. That was the man Abraham. Mm -hmm. Abraham, a man of faith. Why was Abraham regarded as such a man of faith? Well, that he topped them all. I think Abraham, when you looked at his life, he loud, really loud, believed. Loud. He really believed. He believed in things that he did not see. He believed God would raise his son, even though there had never been a resurrection. He believed in the Abraham land believed what he did not see. Yeah. That's faith. No? Yes, and, but, uh, as I look at Abraham as, a, as one of God's, as you say, champion in the cause, because... Right now, we are here, and some of us, we don't even, if we should be told that we need to leave the house that we bought, or the car that we have driving, 
and go to a place that we don't know where we are going. We will not have to do that. But Abraham, when he was called, when God gave him the word, he didn't know where he was going, yet he packed up everything and said, here am I. I'm moving on. I'm going. And not, not only that, but then the day came and God says, Abraham, I'm going to give you a child. And that child went through so much. Abraham went ahead and believed, uh, obeyed his wife and went to his, his maid and brought a son into the world and the Lord says, ah, uh -uh, that's not it. Jesus stopped by one day with, on his way to Sodom and he says, uh, Abraham, Sarah must be the woman, must be the mother of that child. Sarah laughed, me, 90 years old, and our lesson says Abraham was a dead man for that matter. He was a 100 years old. 100 year old man going to have a child? Wife, 90 years old. Sarah laughed. Abraham says, well. And after all that problem, Isaac was born. 25 years of waiting and disobeying the Lord. Isaac was born. Now, after 25 years of life, there's a young man, nice, healthy, strong, 25-year-old young man. God says, Abraham, take him up to Mount Moriah and kill him. Would you do that? The boy I waited for so long. As the elders said, many of us, if the Lord asks you to pull up stakes from your apartment and from where you live now and come with me, I, many of you wouldn't even pay God attention. You wouldn't go. Abraham did. And so it is. There he is upon Mount Moriah. Would Abraham have killed that boy? Why would he have killed that boy? Because God says so. And there is another little reason. What is that other reason? Faith and, well, belief. He believed, brother pastor, that God would resurrect that child. That's right. But did he ever see resurrection before that? Never seen a resurrection then before. Then how come you believe God is going to resurrect? By him? faith. He By believed. faith. By faith. Well, he had let God down so many times. God waited until he was an old man mm. before he presented this uh, uh, action for Abraham to perform. And Abraham thought all kinds of things. On three days it took him to get to Mount Moriah. But he reasoned in his mind that if God said to kill my son, I know he could resurrect him, even though there was never heard of a resurrection before then. That's a but lot he of faith, stepped isn't it? out in faith Woo. to believe God. No wonder the lesson says he topped them all. Yes, and he, he, Abraham knows that God is the giver of life. He's yes, the giver sir. of life. Hallelujah. And not only that, but before Abraham died, he wrote, Bible says he looked for a city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. What's that? That's nothing here. That's not over in Jerusalem, over in Palestine, in Canaan. That's the new Jerusalem. So one day it is going to be a reality. Abraham looked for a city with foundation whose builder and maker is God. Okay, I'm, I'll be looking at um, Tuesday and Wednesday. Tuesday under the caption of Moses believing in the unseen and Wednesday by faith, Rehab and the rest. So we'll now take a look at the first, which is Tuesday, Moses believing in the unseen. Here we see a picture of all Israel with no courage. First, at the time when they so needed it most. 
to solve their problem, did God command them to sit down and pray? No. He command, his command was that they go forward, that Moses first would lift Israel and stretch forth his hand to divide the sea that they will go through. And the multitude, they did go through. That's faith. Moses had that, have that faith and he lifted the rod, they went through. The lesson shows that the unfailing faith, courage, and action is the cooperation that is required from the converted Christian. Every advance steps of the way in God's leading and it's always, this always brings mm -hmm. success. Mm -hmm. Never failure. Yes, God is not the one or the person identify with failures. He is always a God of success. We look, as the folks there, they were discouraged. The Israelites. Discouragement is one of the snares of the devil to get, to bring defeat to God's people if they, if we allow those snares to trap us and beset us, we will be defeated by them. But once we place our strength, our faith, our belief in the Almighty God, the unseen, we will be victorious over the adversary. In the spiritual realm, in that era, we are in a spiritual war warfare as God's people. The Christian's adversary is Satan. He does not rest. He's always on the move to snatch God's people. But God is so great. And he said we are to seek the opportunity to break down the walls of this discouragement that faces us from time to time when Satan tried to trap us. So he said, once we put our hands in his and our faith and trust in him, defeat will never be a part of our dwelling. Uh, Elder, Elder Samuels, I see in this part of the lesson also that uh, Moses could be king of Egypt. Yes, he could be. How come? He, as we, we later down, I'll be looking at it just now. Yes, sir. He says the situation there, the question was asked, what were the similarities between the situation of the original recipients of the Hebrews and the experience of Moses. Mm. And we can pick up the, the um, information or the story in Hebrews 11, 20, 24 to 27, and then we look at Hebrew, Hebrews 10, 32 to 35. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was, um, uh, like a couple of years ago, young, very younger, when I accepted the message, like about age 19, Back home in Jamaica, we used to have to do the morning watch. Mm. And I remember this very text so much. Hebrews 11, 24 to 27. That Moses, when he was come of years, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Mercy. Why? Choosing. He, yes, chose, he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of life in Egypt for a season. That was just for a season. Yes, sir. They wanted to promote him, to elevate him to a position in Israel. He said, no, I'm choosing, I rather choose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to en enjoy the pleasures of Israel just for a season. You know, some, you know some Elder Samuels, in order for Moses to become Pharaoh, he had to join their religion. Yes. And be part of that caste. And you, can you imagine the pressure that they put on Moses to change his religion from the religion of serving God to the religion of Ra? 
the sun god and all the other gods they had. And Moses refused to do this. Now, this was not just a one-time thing. They was constantly on his case to make this change. Now, we as Christians have to understand this. The devil will always find a way to divert our minds from the race that we're in this Christian race, yes. and, and, and give us things and, and promise us things. And, and some people in the world have sold their, their souls to the devil in order to receive success. But we are in this race to the end. I, I, I'm going to put it like this. Jesus is our biggest cheerleader. That's right. He, there he is at the finish line, and I don't want to get ahead of myself because I got something coming up. He's at the finish line saying, you can make it. Yes. I made it. You can make it. He's our biggest cheerleader. And he's not saying there will not be obstacles that we're going to have to go through. We're going to have to run uh, obstacles. It's not a straight race. You know, it's good if, if, if we just ran from this podium down to the back door and say straight. Oh, man, that's good. But we talk about obstacles that we have to go through. But he said, I did it. You can do it. Yes. 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 And as we, we, we were looking at the the similarities between the folks there, the Israelites, and Moses back then. We, we, we look at the, these, two, these two texts of the shows, the comparison that in Hebrews 11, 24 to, 30, to um, 27, and Hebrews 10, 32 to 35, the, the comparison there is that by faith, the original recipients of the Hebrew, they, they believe, though they did not see. Yes, yes. Moses the same. He believed in God by faith, though he did not see. Mm -hmm. And then now, they, 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 as Hebrew 10, 32 and 35 says, cast not away, therefore, your, 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 um, the, the, your faith are the recompense of reward. They look for a city whose builder and maker is God. So, so they anticipate that greatness of God. So with faith, they know that they will be in that place where they will live a life that is far greater than they are experiencing just now. As we move on to the other day, the next day, Wednesday, under the caption, by faith, Rehab, and the rest. Rehab is classified in scripture as a notorious harlot, a prostitute, a prostitute. Yet God put place her in his hall of fame, as Pastor said. The question is, why was Rahab, a pagan prostitute, included in this text of sacred biblical character? Rahab, harlot, a prostitute, yet she was included in the hall of fame. In this, these, among these biblical characters that God set apart and say, come. You are my children. And we look, we see that in Hebrew 11.31. Rehab perished not with them that believed not in the conversion. Right? She was not an isolated case of God's mercy towards idolaters who acknowledge his divine authority. Rahab's deed of faith was that she heard, believed, believed, and obeyed, even though she did not see. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is what takes her into God's hall of fame. She believed, she obeyed, and she heard, Our and request. she acted. Upon this faith and this belief, and what she heard. Yes, please. Is the fact that Rahab did not see 
basically the miracles of God herself. Is that the reason why we should be seeing her in the Hall of Fame? Because we basically are in her position. We have not seen anything that God has done, only read it. And now we should basically be like Rahab, believing what we have read. You know, Rahab did something that the children of Israel didn't do. The children of Israel were there. They went through the Red Sea. They crossed over the River Jordan. They killed off some of the mighty kings. And still, they had a lack of faith. That's why they spent 40 years walking around the wilderness before God allowed them to go in. But here they came upon this prostitute who was a pagan, by the way. She wasn't a Hebrew. And, and, and when she addressed the two spies, she said, I want you to know that the God that you serve, the, everybody here in this land, their hearts are faint. She said, we heard about when this people, three million plus people came through the Red Sea. She heard about how the weapons of war that should have sunk when the Red Sea overcame the Egyptians and it floated. She heard about, she never seen the manna come down from heaven. She never seen these things, but she took it by faith. She said, I heard this and I believe this, that your God is a God of gods. So therefore, she had faith when some of us do not have faith. We are supposed to walk by faith. That's what she did. And not by sight. That's our problem as Christians today. And we can still overcome it. We need to walk by faith. If God said it, we should believe it. Amen. We don't have to see it. Uh, 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 what was that? Thomas? Doubting Thomas said, oh, yeah, you know, I heard that, you know, you said Jesus rose from the dead, but until I put my finger in his side, then I, I will believe. And Jesus told him, he said, what about those who have never seen and believe? And here you are, you've seen, and now you're going to believe once you see it. We need to move on from that and walk by faith and not by sight. When, when we... When we have the, developed that trusting relationship, we will not waver. That will give us the strength and the power to move forward in spite of. Because if, if, I, if I'm with someone now and I don't have that trust in them, I will not want to move in a certain way with them. Because if I come now and i just meeting you for the first time, I will not have that want to go that a certain. Well, you can't depend on me with you, because I'm I'm not gonna have that trust in you as yet. But when I develop that relationship, that trust that we have now developed with God, we will move at the first word. So we need to develop that faith and trust in the Master that we can. Just act as he says, and we will go. Thank you. Rahab the harlot. Rahab did not see the wilderness experience, but she believed. Yes, yes she did. And Jesus counseled us on several occasions. If we must be saved in God's kingdom, it's going to take a lot of faith. There are some things we will not see. Jesus says, blessed are those who believe mm -hmm. and yet not see. Yeah, that's it. You know, looking at, starting with Thursday, chapter 12 of Hebrews, like this, it, wherefore seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. That's all the people that we've seen in the, chapter 11. Yes, sir. He said, now look, look toward that. It, witnesses let us lay aside every weight my lord these witnesses they have overcome and the sin which doth so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us in those days you had only one winner if there was a race only one person could win but in this race Everyone can win, from the weakest saint to the strongest saint. 
This is a marathon. It is not a sprint. I, I, I like this. When Jesus says, he says, uh, run the race of faith, look to Jesus. He endured the cross. Now, he's sitting on the right hand of God on his throne. He said, this is your reward. If you run the race, you will receive the promise. And the promise that we need as individuals is freedom. Freedom from what? Freedom from sin. The devil, he is like a roaring lion, roaming around, seeking whom he may devour. And a lot of times he gets us and he tricks us. We have to resist. The Bible said resist the devil and he will what? Flee from, Flee from us. But we have to have the mindset to do that. He said he is the only one, Jesus is the only one who has finished the race in his fullest sense. Second, it was actually Jesus' perfect life that has made it possible for these others to run their race. In the end, Jesus is the perfecter of faith because he perfectly exemplifies how the race of faith is to be run. How did he run? He laid aside every weight by giving up everything for us. He never sinned, ever. Jesus held his sight firmly on the reward, which was the joy set before him and of seeing the human race redeemed by his grace. So he endured misunderstandings and abuse. He stared down the shame of the cross. Now, I want to read something from... Testimonies to the church, volume two. He said, in the heavenly race, we can all run and all receive the prize. <laughs> there is no uncertainty, no risk in the matter. We must put on the heavenly graces and with the eye directed toward upward to the crown of immortality. Keep the pattern ever before us. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The humble, self-denying life of our divine Lord we are to keep constantly in view. And then as we seek to imitate him, keeping our eye upon the mark of the prize, we can run this race with certainty. <laughs> Knowing that if we do the very best we can, we shall certainly secure the prize. When we have this great inducement before us, Cannot we run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith? He has pointed out the way for us and marked it all alone by his own footsteps. It is the path that he traveled, and we may with him experience the self-denial and the suffering and the walk in this pathway imprinted by his own blood. Jesus ran the race. He suffered humility. He suffered everything. He said, as long as you are in, with me, you are going to suffer as well. But don't give up. I made it not in my strength, in the strength that my father gave me. He's at the finish line. He said, you can do it. Come, keep coming. We fall down. Like the song said, what? We get up. We fall down, we get up. Jesus saying, you fell down, get up. I fell down, I got up. I kept going. I finished the race. And now where am I? I'm with my father, sitting next to him on his throne. And I want you to sit on the throne with me. Keep going, keep going. God is the author and finisher of our faith. Pastor Willis. Yes. I have a question. Why, why wouldn't, wouldn't we want to compare the, the whole Christian race with a sprint instead of a marathon? Well, let's put it like this, brother. We have a microwave religion, some of us. We just want to stick something in the microwave and nuke it. 
and it's done. It's quick. We think that, 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 that salvation is something that can be done quickly. When we first come to God, it's called justification. And then there's sanctification, which what? It's the work of a lifetime. We are justified with God, but now the race begins. And Jesus said, Satan wants you to fall down. He wants you to sin, but I want you to know if you run this race, and here's the thing. He said, you're not running by yourself. <laughs> I will be there with you. That's why he's told disciples, I'm going to send another comforter, someone that's going to lead you into all truth. So no matter what we go through, and a lot of us went through a lot this week. Can I get an amen? amen. But you know something? When we look beyond what we go through, what is beyond all of that is eternal life. And we have to strive for that. Just like Abraham, he said, my, the building maker I'm talking about is, is Jesus. The, 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 the home that I'm looking for is not Canaan land. I'm looking for the holy city. That's what I'm striving for. We have to take off the blindness that we have and stop looking at the things of this world. Look beyond the world. Look to where Jesus is. And if you plan for that, you will find yourself striving to be where Jesus is. By faith, you become Christ's. And by faith, you are to grow up in him. By giving and taking, you are to give all, your heart, your will, your service. Give yourself to him to obey all his requirements, and you must take all. Let me tell you something. Paul went through a whole lot. If you read about Paul in the Bible, he was Saul of Tarsus. He persecuted the Christians, but when God, when Jesus told him, said, he said, he said, uh, why are you persecuting me? Look what Paul went through, but he did not falter. He kept focused on the prize. That's why when he wrote Hebrews, he could talk with confidence. Don't cast away your confidence. Don't do that. Because when, if you cast away your confidence, you will fall to the wayside. Don't give up your confidence in Jesus. He it will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always there. Even when you don't see him, you can't put your hands on it. But look at what we studied in Hebrews chapter 11. Rahab, Moses, Abraham. They didn't touch anything, but they put their confidence in God and said, if you said it, I believe it, and Jesus said, I said it, and I believe it, and I'm going to help you make it through. So, God, uh, go uh, ahead. Uh, Brother Pastor, we have uh, our study tells us today that they're in the light of what's ahead of us. Canaan is a reality. Yeah. God promised, and there is going to be salvation. Yes. And our lesson says, in the light of all of this, we are to lay off some weight. Yes. What are some of these weights? You know, there are some of the things that some of the temptations of the world, it looks good. We have a problem. Instead of saying what God says, we say, but this is what I think. I don't, we, we should never worry about what we think. What did God say? So we pick up these little things along the way, and these weights will slow us down. These little temptations that we think, well, the Bible says that we shouldn't do this, but I, I think the way I think, nobody asks us what we think. What did the Word of God say? Jesus told Satan, he said, he said, that, uh, he told him, said, the Word, he kept referring back to the Bible. He kept referring back to the Bible. He didn't have to parlay with him. So if we pick up some of these things, these temptations that we run into, we see things on TV, and it looks good. And we say, I think I'll try that. But when we realize, when the Holy Spirit tells us, no, stop doing it. Because if we have too many of these weights, it will slow us down. And guess who's hot on our trail is the devil. 
And these weights can soon become a sin. And sin will keep us out of heaven. God hates sin, but the beautiful thing is he loves the gotta, sinner. We've got to lay off some weights. Yes. Or you need to identify them now. You need to identify some of these weights, and if you don't identify them, you can't lay them off. Alice. You've got to, some of us can stay out of that refrigerator. <laughs> that too. That's one of those the dangerous. Don't get so big. Put on weight. In temperate eating. One of the weight is we've got to stop hating so much. Hate. Malice. Mm -hmm. Lying. These weigh you down. You can't run the race. You can't run. Finish I know this. Hey, you know, you wonder why. Why am I not making progress? Is because... Now, like one of the things you said about lying, you know, it's, one, it's different between a telling a lie and being a liar. If you are a liar, that means you are a perpetual liar. Mercy. You lie Logical. all the time. And after a while, we'll start to think, well, it's okay. You know, I just told a little white lie. Ah. There's no such thing as a white lie or a pink lie or a yellow lie. It's not giving it color. A lie is a lie. Jesus. And God hates liars because the devil is the what? He's the author of all lies. These, it's the little things that will keep us out of, out of heaven, not some of the big things because we can identify with the big things. Like he said, the refrigerator, we go to the refrigerator and look and say, I know I shouldn't eat this, but the Lord understands. I have a sweet tooth, so like me, I, I, I have a sweet tooth. You can look at me and tell that. But the thing is, there are times when I will eat it, and I said, I shouldn't have. Lord, please help me to overcome. Mercy. Because I look at it like this. If that will keep me out of the kingdom, take the taste from me. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at the athlete now, Pastor, that... In this race, we notice that the athlete, the 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 um the least clothes clothing they wear mm -hmm. because the 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 weight their weight going or competing in this race have to be at a certain poundage, or else you will lose or you will not be able to move forward. Mercy. And the key in the race, this Christian race that we are running in. Is endurance, endurance, enduring to the end. In the sprint race, we start and it's a snap. But the marathon is a race that we have to endure. It Bless brings out, it brings out the fortitude in us as and God's people, enduring to the end. But what you see is the key. That, sorry, but when you see all this, the more that you use your faith, the stronger your faith grows. And we have to remember what they said in Proverbs: you know, trust in the Lord. You know, with all your heart and all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. So the more you use your faith, the stronger it grows and the le you know, you won't fall as much. You know, you may fall every now and again, but he will always hold you up. As there, there's another section there that is you're leaving out that we are not to lean unto our own understanding, but unto the the understanding of the master. Let me say this, that we have to remember that faith is a spiritual muscle. And a lot of times we ask God to increase our faith. Be careful what you, because he will help you and take you through some straight places to see where, are, where you are in your spiritual life. If you're not able to go through these things, then God will not, first of all, he will not put you through it. Because why? God is faithful. He's measured the problem, and he sees that if you can handle it, he will allow you to go through it. If not, he will make a way of escape. So we have to be careful. We want to exercise our spiritual faith. Exercise it. But don't get so carried away that while you exercise it, you be, that you, you go on uh, steroids. <laughs> and, 
<laughs> yes, sir. And the devil will give you some steroids. So we have to identify between the f true faith and what the devil will try to throw a counterfeit in our path to upset us in our race. Pseudo faith. Oh, my goodness. That's what we've got to watch for. God promised Israel the promised land. Did they get it? Yes, they did. Although they did not, all two million did not get there, but God kept his promise. He promised us an eternal Canaan. Jesus is going to come again. And the eternal Canaan will be yours if you are faithful. God will keep his promise, won't he? Moses, Elijah, the 24 elders, and all these saints are in heaven. But they have not yet received the reward. That's why Moses appeared on Mount of Transfiguration and he said, Lord, you have got to go to the cross. For if, we do, if you didn't go to the cross, we've got to come back. They have not yet received the reward. Although they are in heaven, yes. you know what's happening? The Bible says they are waiting for us yes. so that together yes. we will receive the reward of eternal life. Oh, Jesus hang on Calvary's cross and the Bible says he endured the cross. Jesus was crucified naked on the cross. Yes. The worst kind of death that any human, any Romans could, could put on anyone. Jesus endured that death. But the Bible says he had a reason why he endured it. Despised the shame. Why? Because he looked beyond the cross. And he see you. And he see you, dear friend. He see you and you marching through the pearly gates being saved in God's kingdom. And because of that, he says, I'll endure the cross. I despise the shame. The day he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, waiting. Soon and very soon, Jesus will be here again. Make sure you are saved. God wants to save you, beloved, more than you want to be saved. Just obey, believe his promise. He promised and he's a promise keeping God. Yes, soon and very soon he that shall come will come. Yes, sir. Right. And will not tarry. Thank you Lord for what we have learned from the study of the Bible. Yes, oh help us Lord to be faithful. Come soon dear Lord. Take your children home to live with you forever. Yes. This we ask in the precious name of Jesus our Savior. Amen. And amen. God bless you. We welcome you back next week. We shall continue when we will study about receiving an uh, unshakable kingdom. Next Sabbath, same time, same place. Come again. Let's study God's word. to be a man. Listen, I determined that I was never going to do praise and worship the same again. After these last almost two years, this is the fullest church that I've seen. And for us to be here, if some of us, if not all of us, have lost somebody in this interim. So if you are just happy to be here in God's presence, we don't even have to, the, 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 the stage has been set for the Holy Spirit to enter in so that whatever we manifest, whatever we're in need of today, God is going to give it to us. I know that and I decree it. Who else believes that with me today? Amen. Hallelujah. 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 All we want is for God's spirit to rest on us, yes. to break open when, when the word is brought to us that we'll all receive something. And I know we all know this one. Spirit of 
There's nothing worth more that could ever compare. Nothing can compare. You are our living hope. Your presence, Lord. See, I've tasted and seen the sweetest of love when my heart becomes free. My chains are undone. Your presence, Lord. And then we say, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come flood this place. Come flood this place and fill the air. Welcome to CWC. My name is Lavona, and we are so glad that you've decided to join us for worship this morning. Before we join the service, I would like us to reflect on Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. It is my prayer that you will answer that knock and allow Jesus to enter into your heart. We pray that you are blessed by the service this morning and that God impresses something special on your heart. Now, let's join the service already in progress. To his name, bring an offering and come into his courts. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fair before him all the earth. The church is now called to worship. and your mercy we ask for your presence with us today 
then bless us. Lead us by your spirit to praise and give glory to your name and your name only. We come before you with grateful thanks and with hearts long to adore and worship you. We pray that you would reveal your love to us. Grant us today the ability to worship you in spirit and in truth. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. CWC, welcome to everyone. Whether you are here visiting with us, or you're a regular member, or you're joining us in our online spaces, welcome, welcome, welcome. On this Sabbath day, feel free to indulge in songs of praises, prayer, and thanksgiving to God. So on behalf of our pastor, Jason Ridley, and the CWC family, welcome into this house of worship, or welcome to this virtual platform of praise. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's time for announcements. Please pay close attention. On a sad note, we announce the passing of Elder Angela Sandy's mom. And we're also giving you information about where the service will be. Um, this is also Sister Tiana Thomas's grandmother. So please don't forget to pray for them. The funeral service will be held on March 17th. Uh, viewing will be at 4 p.m. and the service will be at 5 p.m. at the Carib Funeral Home at 1992 Utica Avenue in Brooklyn. The zip code is 11234, just in case you need it for your GPS. Okay, on a brighter note, uh, Family Life will be having their first in-person program on March 19th from 2.30 p.m. to 4 p.m. The focus, men and women's reproductive sexual health slash issues with Dr. Carlton Barneswell, urologist, and Dr. Francine Hippolyte, ob obstetrician gynecologist. And it's open to all males and females 18 years and older. Tonight, Women's ministry will have their usual virtual fireside chat. And let me tell you, it's an awesome event. I'm going to invite all women to attend. Um, men can attend too. They didn't exclude anybody. At 7 p.m. tonight. And the Zoom ID is 895-0601-8256. And all our passcodes um, are CWCSDA. That's the passcode you use for all CWC events. And the title is Sharing Her Story. It's very, very interesting. Don't miss it. AY is postponed, I guess because of the weather. And uh, next Sabbath, Bible class will be at 4 p.m. And all other programs will be pushed back. Please bear those things in mind and don't forget to share with other people so that we can have a good gathering. Thank you.
Is 528, 528, the aim of worship, a shelter in the time of storm.
be seated. A shelter in the time of storm. What a fitting song. As we go to God in prayer. A shade by day. A defense by night. A shelter in the time of storm. The raging storms may round us beat, but a shelter in the time of storm. I wonder if I have any witnesses here today who has seen God be a shelter in the midst of your storms. That you know that when you called on him, he covered you. So I don't know about you, but I'm excited today. That in the midst of what we're dealing with, in the midst of what you're going through, in the midst of the challenges, in the midst of the losses that we sometimes uh, face in life, the reason that, that we still press on, the reason that we can still keep going on, the reason that we're still in the fight, we're still in the journey is because God was a shelter. He gave us refuge. In the time of storm, doesn't matter what kind of storm it was, doesn't matter how long the storm lasted, but God was and is our shelter. So we say thank you. Today, today we have so much to, to pray for as we remember the war that is still ravaging in Ukraine. And even as it hits home, we remember the passing of Sister Dolores Sandy, the mother of Angela, and the grandmother of it's Tiana. We remember them today, but thankful that God will be the shelter for Natalie Williams and all of the other prayer requests that we, we have for Alphurst. We thank God for being a shelter. So if you want to press closer to the shelter in the time of your personal storms today, I invite you to come to the altar as the praise team sings at this time.
Father, in the name of Jesus. We first pause for this moment. Just to say thank you. Father, some of us even right now can't see our way. But we say thank you. Some of us don't know if we're coming or if we're going. But we say thank you. Some of us don't know when this trial is going to end. But we'll still say thank you. Some of us are wondering, God, when will this be over? When will my change come? But in spite of it all, God, we'll still declare and say thank you. We say thank you, God, because in the midst of it all, you still kept us. Because you've been a shelter in the time of storm. God, that's why we haven't lost our minds. That's why we haven't given up. That's why we're still in the faith. That's why we're still going strong. Because we thank you, God, for being a shelter in the time of storm. But God, you've been much more than a shelter in the time of storm. But we thank you, God, for being a doctor in the hospital room. We thank you, God, for being a cushion when we were in that car accident. We thank you, God, for being our finances and our, our resources uh, when we lost our job. We thank you, God, for being a sustainer when we didn't know how we would make it through and through this pandemic. God, we thank you, God, for, for being our comfort uh, when our family walked out on us. We thank you, God, that in spite of everything that we've gone through, you have been there every step of the way. God, even right now, as we call out Angela and her family, who are mourning the loss of a mother and grandmother, we thank you, God, for the life and the years that you gave them to each other. We thank you, God, even in this moment, God, we can even say thank you for rest. Because we know Sister Sandy has had some hard times. But we're thankful, God, even for this moment now when she's able to rest. And we can say thank you, God, because not only are you a shelter in the time of storm, but you're also a God with resurrection power. So we know, God, that this rest is a temporary rest. But we can say with confidence, God, we believe that, that, that one day soon and very soon, God, that we will see her again. This time with no more pain, no more challenges, no more uh, issues, no more nursing homes or anything, God, but she'll walk in newness of life in full health, never to be tired, never to be weary, never to be hurt again. And so we say thank you. We thank you, God, for all of the others in our church who have lost loved ones. Some have traveled home now to bury their brothers and, and sisters and parents. God, we thank you because you're God who still has resurrection power. God, even now in the midst of this tragic war, we say thank you. Because God, we know that if the enemy had his way, the destruction would be a lot worse. But we're praying right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would intervene. And we're calling and praying for an end to this fight. While we long for that day, God, when we will study war no more. And so God, right now, we say thank you. Some of us, as when we end this prayer, are going to get up and go back to their seats, still not knowing when this storm will end. 
but yet we thank you in the midst of it all God because you've kept us you're keeping us because you have been a shelter in our time of storm so we thank you on this day and we give you all the glory that is due your name it is our prayer in Jesus name let every lover of the risen Christ say amen amen and amen Hallelujah in this place. Amen. I mean, you know God's going to work it out. Amen. 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 I'm going to invite the elders to come and join me uh, at this time. We want to just take a moment out in our service. You know, I believe uh, even in worship, there's space to celebrate. The happy occasions and things that are uh, taking place in uh, our members and in the community's lives. Amen? Amen. Amen. And on today, and we want you guys to help us to, to celebrate, we want to announce an engagement. Amen. 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 And some of you may know, some of you may be hearing for the first time, but we're going to invite uh, Miss Cheyenne Woods, and I hope I pronounced this correctly, and Brandon Rampersad. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Let the church say amen. <laughs> but we're going to invite them to come forward. Can you guys give us some, some, some wedding, some happy, good music? And we want to invite this couple. Let's come on, let's stand to our feet and celebrate them at this time. Come on, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. You guys can come on up. But not only do we want to just acknowledge and celebrate their engagement, but we also, as a church, want to pray God's blessing 
over their union at this time. I know they have some family here uh, that has come. If you guys want to come down and join us, be a part of this prayer. And I'm going to invite you two to come stand right here. Amen. Amen. It's a beautiful thing when God brings two people together. Amen. Amen. And um, I'm sure you all know the statistics, things. Um, It's unfortunate, but we live in a society now where at least 50% of marriages may even be a little higher now end in divorce. But we speak against that today. And... uh, We want to pray God's blessings to cover your marriage, but we want to encourage you to know that marriage, and I'm only a few years in it, but there's some who've been been in a lot longer who can even testify more that marriage is work. It takes a lot of work. But, But the key is having God at the center. And, amen, and each of you has to have your own personal relationship with him. And then you can come together, and God has joined you together to help strengthen uh, your ultimate relationship with him so that when it's all said and done and the Lord shall come back, that you as a family can be caught up together, the two of you, your extended family, and whatever children may be blessed through this union. Uh, And we're excited for you guys today, what God's going to do in your life. And I'm going to invite the elders, if you guys can come just a little closer. In church, if you guys can just stretch your hand forward to this couple. Family, if you guys want to come a little closer, and we're going to pray a prayer of blessing and covering over your marriage today. Let's pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. We say thank you. We thank you, God, for this institution was created by you. That man and woman should be joined together in holy matrimony. God, we thank you for bringing Cheyenne and Brandon together. But God, we know that this is only the beginning. And Father, right now, so we pray in the name of Jesus that they have, uh, have decided after years of dating to make this commitment together. We pray, God, that as we pray over them and as they continue to pray together, God, that they will always keep you first in their marriage. God, that they won't rely off of each other's relationship with you, but that each of them will have a personal relationship with you. God, I pray right now that as we surround them and as we stretch hands toward them, that, God, it represents a symbolic covering, your covering over them. And right now, God, we pray against any schemes and devices, anything that the enemy will try to bring to them, God, to destroy this union. God, I speak of, we pray against any person that may come and try to become a hindrance to their marriage but God we claim that what you have joined together let no man put asunder God I pray right now God that 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 they will be on one accord with one another God in the important things in their relationship God in their finances in their communication in their time and in knowing how to make quality time to spend together God I pray even right now God that if it's your will that you would bless This family in the time, in your appointed time, God, God, with however much children that you have in store for them. God, I pray that this marriage lasts throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. God, I pray that 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 when you come back uh, soon, God, that that not one of them makes it into the kingdom, but both of them in the name of Jesus. I pray that their seed, God, that comes from them makes it into the kingdom. God, I pray right now that they would have a long marriage, that no illness or sickness would befall them. 
that no calamities will happen, that, that God, that you would protect them as they travel and drive up and down the busy and dangerous highways. God, I pray right now that you will bless their careers and their livelihood. Amen. God, I pray in spite of what the statistics say, that as they keep you at the head of their marriage, that they would defy the worldly statistics. But I'm praying, God, that their marriage will be an example to other people in other couples that desire a marriage and union together. May their marriage be an example to others of what a Christ-filled marriage looks like. And when it's all said and done, we give you the glory, the thanks for what you're going to do in their lives as these two have made that desire and commitment before God to join in holy matrimony. We thank you and we pray blessings upon their extended family as well. This is our prayer in Jesus name. And the church said amen, amen, and amen. Old Testament reading comes to us from Exodus chapter 20, and I'll read from verse 1 to verse 7. Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 1 to verse 7, and I'll read in your hearing. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Out of the house of bondage, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or in a likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a zealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. The New Testament scripture reading comes to us from Re Revelation chapter 14, verses 1 through 7. I'll read in your hearing. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. And with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the lamb wheresoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the lamb. In their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, 
having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading, hearing, and doing of his holy word. It is now time for us to worship the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. Will our deacons please come forward? The tithe is your increase. It belongs to God. It was his before it was given to us as a token of his trust. The offerings are a statement of our gratitude for God's amazing grace towards us. For God's providing for us. For God's giving us those jobs that allow us to have that life and have it more abundantly. We make ourselves thieves when we refuse to give the tithe to him and ingrates for not demonstrating joyful gratitude. Luke 17, 17 clearly demonstrates our Savior's expectation of gratitude. When Jesus, having blessed the ten lepers with healing, wandered out loudly. And were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? We've made available several means by which you can return your tithes and your offerings. We provided an online site at cwcsda.com or .org. Online giving is the link that you will click on and then tithes and offerings and it will bring you to what looks like an envelope. And you can create your username and password, which you'll use every single time you enter that site. And that's probably the most efficient way to return your tithes and offerings. We've also made available to you a post office box. And that's post office box 340870, Jamaica, New York, 11434. Please make sure your checks are payable to Community Worship Center, Seventh-day Adventist, or SDA. We've also provided a Zelle access at cwcsdatreasurer at gmail.com. And I'm reminding you to please, please, please include a memo that tells us how you want your funds to be applied. And then if that all fails, just call us. Call one of our deacons, an elder, one of the treasury team, and we'll be more than happy to get out to you so that we can bring your tithes and offerings back to the church. Now bring you all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land say of the Lord of hosts. Let us pray. O oh, loving Father, we come before you now with hearts lifted up in thanksgiving. Lord, we know that you are the supreme provider. So we give you thanks for all that has been given to us, all that has been provided to us. And as we return this small portion to you, according to your will. 
Father, we ask now that you will take it and bless it, multiply it, and may it be used in precisely the way it's intended so that this work of the kingdom might be complete, so that your coming will be hastened. We thank you, dear Father, for loving us in spite of ourselves. In Jesus' name I pray with thanksgiving. Amen.
Help magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So this morning we're going to sing about the goodness and the greatness of God. How many know that we serve a great God? And if God be for you, no one can stand before you. Stronger, Lord, you are. 
lost the battle. He's constantly fighting and he's never defeated. This song says he's never lost the battle. Storms may collide, but 
Because Jesus defeated darkness And he has never lost a battle And he never will, he never will And he never will, he never will I said he never will, he never will I know he never will, he never will I said he never will, he never will I said he never will, he never will And he never will, he never will And he never will, he never will Won't always be like this. The Lord will perfect that concern in you, and sooner or later, it's gonna turn in your favor. It's turning around. Concerning me, and sooner or later it will turn in my face. Say sooner or later, it's gonna turn in my face. I said sooner or later, you gotta believe that. There's another song and it says, the struggle is over, the struggle is over for you, the struggle is over, the struggle is over for you, the struggle is over. If you believe that, sing that, the struggle is over. The struggle is over. The struggle is over. Now you can make it personal. For you, the struggle is over. The struggle is over for me. For me, the struggle is over. The struggle is over for you. The struggle is over. How many of you know that life and death is in the power of your own tongue? So you have to declare that in this moment. The struggle is over. The struggle is over. Cause you've been in this place long enough. And your mountainside, it has been rough. But the struggle is over for you.
some of you needed that. encourages somebody who came here on the verge of giving up today. It won't always be like this. You may have come here today feeling defeated. But I want you to know that when you leave today, you don't have to leave feeling defeated. Because as the song says, our God has never lost a battle. And you haven't been defeated. You're just still in the midst of it. But in the end, brothers and sisters, we win every time. sooner or later our God always comes through any witnesses here today so we just thank God in this place uh, Pastor Golf can you hand me my uh, bulletin right there my, the bulletin I wrote some notes on here but just got caught up forgot my bulletin God is amazing. One of my old elders at a church I used to pastor, when he would get happy, would always yell out, who wouldn't want to serve a God like this? And I wonder if I got any witnesses here today know in spite of it all God is still worthy he's still good yea even great and who wouldn't want to serve a God like this some of you can testify that, that you tried a whole lot before you got to God but you know there's nothing better there's no one better so hallelujah praise team thank you ladies for just leading us, ushering us in worship today. Thanks to the male chorus. Amen. The men of God singing in this place. It sounded good. Amen. Amen. You know, I know we've been in COVID, man. I miss that sound, man. I love hearing the choir. Maybe we ought to just bring back some choirs. Well, how, how does that sound? Yeah, the, the choir sound is a beautiful thing. So, men, we thank you. We thank you today. And just everyone, all of you who have come out today, we know some have um, stayed home and tuned in online with the weather, expected weather today. But for all those who have come in person, and even those who are tuning in online here in the New York area and various parts around this world, we thank you uh, for just being with us uh, every Sabbath as we come here to lift up the name of the Lord. Amen. And to encourage uh, one another uh, in, in the faith. I do want to just acknowledge uh, in our presence uh, Pastor Shane Francis. Pastor Shane, why don't you just stand for us? We want to acknowledge your presence here with us today. <laughs> pastor Shane uh, used to pastor here at Northeastern. Uh, he's pastoring now, beginning a new uh, pastoral journey. He was out there serving on the West Coast, but now he is uh, coming back a little closer to the East. 
more toward the Midwest uh, in Indiana and Lake Region Conference. And he'll be getting installed there on April the 2nd. So we just thank you uh, for being here with us today. And let's remember to, uh, pass, uh, remember to just keep Pastor Francis in our prayers as well. Uh, he's here uh, in town today. Um, just unfortunate. Uh, his mother passed this week. So, Pastor, we are, uh, you're in our prayers and we're lifting you up uh, uh, even on, on this day. With the blessed hope, you'll see her uh, again. I just want to thank uh, just all of our leaders here um, who just week after week um, continue to serve and help make um, CWC what it is. Amen? A great place to worship and, and, and to fellowship together and it just starts um, with just those who uh, greet you at the door, uh, those who help to usher you to seats and find uh, a place where you may not, if you're not familiar with, with, with this facility. Uh, just thankful to our, just the deacons and the deaconess and, and all those who week after week uh, just make sure the mics are clean. Amen. 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 <laughs> Still trying to protect us. And just we thank you for all that you're doing. Our media team who make uh, sure that we are up and ready for live streaming. Then, of course, our elders who continue to serve uh, Sabbath after Sabbath, week after week. We just thank you for all um, that you do. And uh, oftentimes they go, go. Uh, we don't always acknowledge them uh, because oftentimes while we're up here, uh, they're not in our presence and we don't see them. But we do want to just acknowledge as well just Sister Deborah and all of those who work in the kitchen faithfully each Sabbath, who make sure there is a meal uh, prepared um, for, for those who want to stay by in fellowship. It's good to be able to come to church and don't necessarily have to rush home, but you can fellowship in God's house on this holy Sabbath day. Amen? Amen. So we just thank, thank all of those um, who are serving in the various uh, capacities. Uh, I do want to just acknowledge just a couple things. Uh, I've noticed that I get, I'm starting to get more and more uh, texts and messages um, on Sabbath. Pastor, can you announce this? Can you say this? And, and some things have already announced. I don't have the uh, time to go through everything again, but I'll just highlight just a couple things. Um, but one, we do want to just make everyone aware that the time does change tonight. Uh, daylight savings uh, time begins tonight. So, so just be aware of that. Uh, but also know how that impacts us here beginning on next Sabbath. Um, all of our afternoon um, programs will begin an hour later. So beginning on next Sabbath, uh, Bible study will begin at 4 p.m. What time did I say? 4 p.m. And then AY will begin at 5 p.m. What time did I say? So that's 4 p.m. for Bible study and 5 p.m. for uh, AY. That's beginning on next Sabbath. Amen? Amen. I do want to um, just mention as well um, to the media team, those who are, are serving today and those who just work with the media team, I want to meet with you briefly in my office uh, after service, so please uh, stop on by. We have to uh, just go over a few things in detail. Um, also, uh, brothers and sisters, so you know next um, month um, we celebrate remember the death of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? A lot of people say it's Easter weekend. I, I like to call it Resurrection Weekend. Amen? And so what I want to say is brothers and sisters, let, let us be mindful and remember that had it not been for the death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior. Coming here on Sabbath will be in vain. He'll be for naught. Are you aware of that? And, and I say that to say because sometimes we have a habit of allowing the weekend where the resurrection and death death and resurrection of our Lord and Savior to just pass on by like it's not really a big occasion. Like it 
does not make all the difference in the world. Are you hearing me? And so we want to plan something very nice, special program for that day. Knowing that had it not been for his death and resurrection, we would all be lost. And so with that, uh, just very quickly, and, and parents, especially our parents, if you're listening online, um, just make note of it. But, but immediately after service, right here down front, um, we want to meet with all of the parents of our children um, because we're hoping and looking to put together a special children's choir for that day. Amen? And so we want you guys to meet with Lavona, Olivia. They're going to all be down front. Um, even if your children are not here today, there's no rehearsal today, but we want to meet with the parents down front immediately after service. Amen? That'll be right here. In this front area, these pews, parents, please um, to stop on by to hear the announcement uh, with them. Um, we also want to just point out as well, uh, just very quickly, um, our women's ministry uh, virtual fireside chat tonight, um, beginning at 7 p.m., sharing her story. And I'll just go over the Zoom information again. The idea is 895-0601-8256. That's 895-0601. 8256. The passcode is CWC SDA. I, I will admit that I, I overheard a little bit of the last fireside chat as my wife was on listening. And uh, they have, and we thank Elder Providence for leading out a really great time um, and sharing pertinent information uh, um, that, and I, as I've heard you say, even. It, it's, it's, it's under women's ministry, but anyone can tune in. And so um, please take time to, 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 to tune in today, beginning tonight at uh, 7 p.m. Amen? And then uh, as well, uh, I believe singles ministry is meeting immediately after church. Uh, so please, singles, um, join with the singles ministry immediately uh, downstairs in multipurpose room number one and that'll be immediately after service amen and I will say we're still hoping uh, to transition some people from singles ministry amen to, to the sugar buns amen amen and having said that I have to just put in my plug again for the speed dating where we're two weeks away from being live I've seen some of the reports that we have people coming from New York, of course, Maryland, uh, Connecticut, maybe some other states as well. So listen, men and women, your blessing may be in store on that evening. Amen. So please, please be on. Come on by. Listen, I'm hoping. As I as I prayed over the couple today, I would love to have the opportunity to announce your engagement. Amen? I still got some prayers in me now. Pray over your marriage. But your blessing may be there at the singles ministry. Amen? For the speed, speed dating. Amen? The beautiful thing is, is speed dating. So if you meet someone, it's like, man, this ain't going to work. Just in a couple minutes, you move on. Amen? You ain't got to spend the rest of the evening talking Having dinner together is just speed. You see it's not a connection. Just move right on to the next one. Amen? Amen. Amen. So that's on March the 26th. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, no, we're going to... We'll, we'll talk to me after church, okay? All right? Let's uh, go to the Word of God. We are in the third week of our designated survivor series. And so let's go back to the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. And I'm going to read in your hearing verses 23 and 24. Come on, stand with me now as we go to the Word of God. 
And let's also remember as well on next Sabbath beginning at 2.30, um, our Family Life uh, Ministries uh, will be having a powerful presentation for both men and women. Uh, it'll be separate presentations uh, dealing with health that you don't want to miss. And it's going to begin on next Sabbath afternoon at 2.30. The women will be here uh, in the sanctuary and the men will be downstairs um, in uh, multi-purpose room one, I believe. Um, but please uh, stay on by. It's normally the time when sugar buns meet, but on next week it's going to be for every individual, 18 or older, in our church. And you want to be a part of that discussion. Amen? Amen. First Kings chapter 17, verse 23 and 24. The word of God says, And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Watch this, brothers and sisters. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Let me read the scripture again. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Then the woman said to Elijah, now, by this I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. For the next few moments, let us consider the message entitled, Ball of confusion ball of confusion bow your heads with you now spirit of the living god fall fresh on me now use me as thy anointed man servant to speak words of life in this your sanctuary this is my prayer in jesus name let every lover of the risen christ say amen amen and amen ball of confusion I once read an article by Penny Flores entitled, Five Elements That Makes a Great Film. For all of the movie lovers out there, the five areas she, she suggested are good characters, simple plot, theme, attention to details, and a good ending. For good characters, uh, she says, characters are the most important part of storytelling. They are the life of a film. When you watch a film, you need to like some of the characters in the film. You should feel like uh, you can relate to those characters. The central character of the film is very important. If people don't like the central character, then the movie won't do well. Secondly, for simple plot, she says, a, a simple plot is enough to win people's hearts. People don't like an elaborated plot. You see, she says, a plot can make or break your cinema. Next, we have the theme. And Penny says, your message should be clear. It is what you want the audience to take away from the movie. You should weave the theme into the story. No audience should leave the room with a bad impression about your film. Fourth, we have uh, what she calls attention to detail. What she says is that details, that the details of the movie are very important. It starts from the point the script is being written, the casting, the shots, etc. must be considered in detail. The audience will appreciate these details. And lastly, we have what she says is a good ending. Penny says the ending of a story is crucial to the success of a movie. Films often get ruined for their bad ending. 
The ending must be done nicely. It must wrap up the story well. Don't drag, she says, the ending too long. It will lose the tune of the movie. Now, speaking of good endings, when I watch a movie, I only like happy endings. I want the main characters to live. I want the bad guy to get caught. I don't want the happy couple to break up. And most importantly, I don't want the movie to end and I'm left hanging. I need a conclusion to the story. And I need it to be a happy ending. But as we dive into our text today, in 1 Kings chapter 17 as a whole, uh, it reminds me of a good film, a good movie. I believe this text has most of, if not all, of the five elements that our author says makes a great film. You see, we have good characters. The main character is the prophet Elijah, who if he were in Hollywood today, uh, he would be known uh, as an A-lister. For you see, Elijah is one of only two men uh, who God took to heaven uh, while they were still alive on this earth. And then uh, in a supporting role, uh, you have the widow woman of Zarephath, uh, who would also be known uh, as an A-lister. She is most notably known uh, for being the only woman uh, God chose to send Elijah to during the famine. Speaking of this choice, uh, Jesus says in Luke chapter 4, uh, But I tell you truly, many widows uh, were in Israel in the days of Elijah when the heaven uh, was shut up three years and six months, uh, and there was a great famine throughout all the land, uh, but to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath uh, in the region of Zidon uh, to a woman who was uh, a widow, so she too uh, was was an A-lister. You also have a, a simple plot. They are navigating through the ups and downs of life as they live uh, through a drought uh, because there had been no rain in the land. There is an overriding theme uh, in the story and that is the sovereignty of God. Uh, God is always in control. Uh, he's the one who held back the rain uh, causing the drought uh, and he is also the one who commanded the ravens uh, to bring food to Elijah every morning uh, and every evening uh, and he is the one who made sure that the widow woman's jar of oil uh, and container of flour never ran out and never became empty. We also have uh, great attention to detail that helps the readers and listeners uh, truly bond with this story uh, as we see Elijah there at the brook uh, being fed by the ravens uh, but yet eventually the brook dries up and we can't help but feel the pain uh, of the widow woman uh, as she's believing that she is about to prepare uh, a last little meal for herself uh, and her son uh, so that they could eat it and die. And lastly, we have the good ending, where the ending of the story is crucial to the success of the film. Our brothers and sisters, but it's right here where I must admit that this story begins to take a turn. It seems like we were heading toward one arc or one ending. But then all of a sudden, there just seemed to be a sudden shift and change of direction in the story. That not even the characters seemed to be aware that it was coming. And it can almost make you wonder, what kind of ending are we heading toward? You see, 1 Kings chapter 17 can be broken up into three parts or three episodes. Or as in movie terms, it can be broken up into three scenes. Scene one would be verses one through seven. Scene two would be verses eight to 16. And scene three would be the ending of the story or film, uh, verses 17 to 24. And Amy Erickson, uh, writing about this chapter, says, uh, 
in the first two episodes of 1 Kings chapter 17, uh, speaking of verses 1 to 7 and verses 8 to 16, uh, things go strictly according to plan. In the first scene, uh, after Elijah prophesies to Ahab that there will be no more rain uh, except by my word, uh, God promises to provide for Elijah using ravens and the wadi. Ravens promptly appeared, uh, promptly and regularly appear uh, with food and the wadi provides uh, water. The second scene uh, begins when the Lord tells Elijah to go and live in Zarephath uh, where God has commanded a widow woman there uh, to feed him. The widow woman says she has no food, uh, but Elijah proclaims uh, that her oil and her meal uh, will not fail. Uh, and again, as predicted, uh, the oil and meal containers uh, replenish every time uh, she went forth uh, to grab more oil and flour. So thus far, it seems like everything has gone according to plan even though they were living through the midst of a drought and famine which has no ending in sight, yet everything seems like it is going according to plan. But then comes scene three. And brothers and sisters, from the very onset, nothing seems like it's going according to plan. As a matter of fact, we be as we begin scene three, we don't even have a word from the Lord. You see, at the beginning of scenes one and two, God speaks to Elijah, giving him instructions. But as we begin scene three, there is no word from the Lord. But verse 17 says, now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick and his sickness was so serious that there was no breath left in him. In other words, the boy, her only son, has died. This is supposed to be the end of the story, the end of the film. Elijah survived the drought by the brook Cherith when he arrived in Zarephath and the widow and her son was down to their last meal, but they have survived this long drought trusting in the word of the Lord that the jar of oil and the container of flour will never run out and sure, if not, and sure enough they have not missed a meal and now the story should be coming to a close uh, we're down to the end of the chapter and we're looking for the drought and famine uh, to end uh, and we all have a happy ending uh, uh, happy have a happy ending uh, having survived the drought uh, but that's not what we see here uh, as scene three begins to open but what we see here, brothers and sisters, is the total opposite. Because what we see here just leaves us with questions. Lord, anybody ever had questions? Lord, why would you spare the child's life by providing him food and making sure that he doesn't starve to death during the drought just to turn right around and let him die from a sickness. But God, not only did you spare his life, but you spared his mother who was going to eat the last meal and die with him, but you spared both of them. But now this same mother has had to watch her only son die of a sickness. You wouldn't let him die of starvation, but you let him die from sickness. And honestly... We're just left in a confused state of mind. But we're not the only ones because even our two main characters in the story seem to be surprised and confused by this new development. The new twist in the plot. You see, verse 18 to 20 says, So she said to Elijah, What have I to do with you? Oh, man of God, have you come to bring my sin 
to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him out of her arms and carried him to the upper room where he was staying. And he laid him on his own bed. Then he cried out to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought tragedy on the widow with whom I lodge by killing her son? The widow woman who is distraught and confused asked Elijah, what have I done to you? Is this the real reason you came to my house to take my son's life away? She begins, brothers and sisters, to think back and even uh, questions her own past mistakes, uh, trying to do whatever she can uh, to rationalize what just happened. And I can hear and I can see her in my mind uh, right now saying to Elijah, I trusted you. I let you into my house. You see, brothers and sisters, she just didn't feed Elijah but she welcomed him into her home. I did all those things for you when I didn't even know you, and this is how you repay me. This is what your God does to me. And Elijah, he's just as confused as the widow woman. He's at a loss for word, and so the only thing he says to her is just give me your son. And he took the boy out of her arms and takes him into the upper room where he was staying and laid him down on his own bed. Then Elijah begins to cry out to God and he questions God, indicating to us the fact that he was not forewarned. He did not know what was going to happen. You see, Elijah was told about the coming drought and famine in the land, but God did not tell him about the calamity that was about to befall the widow woman's son. So he questions God. How could you do this to this woman? Of all the women, why this woman? This is the woman, God, who you sent me to who has been nothing but kind and welcoming to me. She has prepared meals and opened her home up to me and let me lodge here. Why let her son die? Why, God, take her son away? And they were both brothers and sisters in that moment left feeling despair, feeling distraught, and feeling confused. And as we read the story and get to this third scene with our thoughts centered on a good ending, but we too, brothers and sisters, are left feeling confused. But if we are honest today, we must admit that every now and then in our own Christian journey, in our own walk with God, uh, that every now and then we go through experiences uh, where we go through seasons uh, where we just don't understand why uh, and we're left feeling confused. In my own experience, uh, I don't have to look back very far. Uh, I, I, in 2020, uh, I had some losses that left me feeling distraught uh, and confused. Uh, on March 26th, uh, 2020, I lost my grandmother who helped raise me uh, and was more like a mother to me. Uh, and then a month later, on April the 27th, uh, my wife's grandmother uh, went into the hospital that morning and never came out. Uh, she passed away later that day uh, and, and, and because of COVID, uh, we weren't able to give either one of them uh, a proper funeral and burial. And then, brothers and sisters, a month and a half after that, uh, my wife had a miscarriage uh, and we lost our first child uh, who we both believed that in the midst uh, of the pain of losing our grandmothers, uh, that our baby that was on the way uh, was our special blessing from God uh, in the midst of the grief that we were feeling. Uh, but now there is no more baby. And I just couldn't understand. And I had to question God, why? Why did me and my wife have to experience all of this at the same time? And sometimes, 
you're just left feeling distraught and confused. It's confusing sometimes uh, when one day you seem to be up uh, on the mountaintop, uh, but the next day you're in the valley. Uh, it's confusing when on Monday uh, you had a job, uh, you went to work, uh, but on Tuesday uh, you're filing for unemployment. Uh, it's confusing to one day uh, uh, have a happy and vibrant marriage, uh, but in a moment all because somebody ran uh, a red light uh, and they are no longer two, uh, but only one is left and alive. It's confusing sometimes when it seems like all hell is breaking loose and there is no let up. It's confusing sometimes when you continue to pray for a breakthrough, but instead of a breakthrough, everything just seems to continue to break. It's confusing sometimes when you've lived right, you've eaten right, you've exercised daily, but you still come down with that cancer diagnosis. I wish I was talking to somebody here today. It's confusing uh, sometimes uh, as a black person in this country uh, just trying to live uh, while being black uh, and thus having police across this country uh, called on you uh, and urged to investigate you uh, for simply doing regular stuff uh, like operating a lemonade stand, uh, like barbecuing at a park, uh, like moving into an apartment, uh, like not waiting in your hand as you leave an Airbnb, uh, like eating lunch on a college campus, uh, like shopping while you're pregnant, uh, like waiting for a friend at Starbucks, uh, like working out at a gym. Uh, listen, just the other day, uh, uh, Ryan Kugler, a black man, uh, and the director of the movie Black Panther uh, was put in handcuffs uh, and almost arrested uh, because a Bank of America teller uh, mistook him for a bank robber. How many bank robbers you know use their real driver's license? a withdrawal slip and their actual bank account number when they're trying to rob a bank. You see, and every now and then, brothers and sisters, you're just left feeling confused. But speak of the confusion. But speaking of confusion, as we look back at the text, I discovered two things that are important that I see are happening here. You see, I'm glad, brothers and sisters, that I, didn't, that I did not stop reading the story. You see, because as the third scene begins to open, it seems like the story makes a drastic shift. And it did not seem like we were heading toward a good ending. But I'm glad that I kept on reading. You see, sometimes you have to keep watching uh, uh, the movie. It may be a little confusing right now. Uh, you may not understand where it's going right now, uh, but you have to keep watching till the end. And even though, uh, uh, I, as I see the widow woman's son lying there dead on the bed, uh, and it seems confusing, uh, how uh, did we get here? Uh, but if you just keep on reading, uh, if you just keep on watching, uh, and, in your, and in your own personal life, uh, if you just keep on living, uh, you'll begin to see that the story wraps up well. Uh, the creator puts a good ending on the story, uh, and here uh, in the midst of the confusion, we find two things happening. The first thing we find happening here is that Elijah doesn't lose faith in the midst of the confusion. Remember, Elijah was not forewarned that the boy was going to die. He did not know if there was a greater plan at work here. The only thing he's aware of is what has happened thus far. The boy got sick and he died. And now his mother is pointing the finger at Elijah and his God that they are the cause of her only child's demise. But Elijah 
takes the now deceased boy upstairs and lays his lifeless body on the bed. And verse 21 and 22 says, and he stretched himself out on the child three times and he cried out to the Lord and said, oh Lord my God, I pray, let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he revived. Because Elijah did not lose faith in the midst of the confusion, he knew who to call on. So he stretched himself out on the boy three times. It's as if he laid prostrate on the boy and he began to call on the name of the Lord. And he said, Lord, let this child's soul come back to him. In other words, he said, Lord, please revive him again. You see, brothers and sisters, Elijah knew who to call on. He knew that he could call on the same God who fed him with the ravens. He knew that he could call on the same God who made sure that the widow woman's jar of oil and container of flour never became empty. The same God who did those miraculous things, Elijah knew was the same God who could raise this little boy from death to life. And what we need to understand today is that the God we serve is the same God no matter what you're going through right now he's the same God he's a God who's not changed by your circumstances but he's a God who can change your circumstances brothers and sisters we wouldn't lose faith so easily if we remembered that he is the same God he's the same God who stood with the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace he's the same God who raised last Lazarus from the dead. He's the same God who took two fish and five loaves of bread and fed 5,000. He's the same God who walked on water. He's the same God who gave blind Bartimaeus his sight. He's the same God who made the woman with the issue of blood whole. Let me bring it closer. He's the same God who was with you in the hospital. He's the same same God uh, who was with you when your marriage fell apart. Uh, he's the same God uh, who provided for you when you lost it all. Uh, he's the same God uh, who kept you uh, when you didn't want to be kept. Uh, he's the same God who delivered you uh, when the enemy was encamped all around you. Uh, he's the same God who blocked it uh, uh, when the devil tried to destroy you. Uh, and it's because uh, Elijah understood understood who he was uh, is why he didn't lose faith uh, when nothing around him was making any sense. So glad that the God I serve is the same God. Now, now the second thing we find here is that this circumstance was not created for confusion but conviction. We learned in verse 22 that God has answered Elijah's prayer and the boy has come back to life. He has been revived. Verse 23 says, and Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Now watch verse 24. Here's the key. Then the woman said to Elijah, now by this. I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is the truth. Brothers and sisters, you see, the circumstance was not created for confusion, but conviction. Watch what's going on here. Elijah has come down from the upper room, not with a dead child, but with a child alive and vibrant, breathing again. 
And he says to the woman, see, your son lives. And the widow woman responds to Elijah, now I know you are a man of God. And more importantly, the words you speak from the Lord are the truth. So you got to get this. So what we see happening here is that evidently the miracle that God has given Elijah and the widow woman where he has sustained and provided for them by making sure that her jar of oil and container of flour never goes empty, never runs out, has not made much impact on this widow woman. Think about that for a second. Imagine being down to your last meal, but God steps in and provides. And day after day, month after month, the only two containers you have, which should be dry and empty by now, yet every time you go there to draw out, instead of coming up empty, you find the provisions that you need. Imagine that being your experience, but this has been the widow woman's experience every day, and yet she still struggles to believe in Elijah and his God. And it wasn't until she lost all hope when she watched her one and only child, her son, die. And it took God raising her son from death to life to finally get her to the place of conviction where she could finally declare to Elijah that by this experience, I know for a fact that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord that you speak is the truth. In other words, what she's saying to Elijah is now I truly believe that you are a prophet and your God is the one and true living God. You see, the death and resurrection of her son, that whole circumstance was created, not for the confusion it caused, but for conviction. It was the circumstance needed to push this woman towards salvation. Because understand, brothers and sisters, God's desire was not to just feed her physically, but his ultimate desire was to nourish her spiritually. And what we have to understand today is that the purpose for a lot of the stuff we're dealing with now is not confusion, but God is trying to bring us to conviction. And it's important that we realize this today because some of us are living lives that are epitomized by the temptation song, Ball of Confusion. Now the song's lyric says, Ball of Confusion, that's what the world is today. And with the current state of this country and with the current state of this world, I don't know if there have ever been any more truer lyrics written in a song. But the reality today is that it's not just in the world or in this country because for some of our lives right now, they are a ball of confusion. Nothing seems to be going right. Nothing seems to make sense. But in the midst of the confusion, we have to realize that God has a greater purpose. Maybe he's trying to teach us faith. Or teach us patience. Maybe he's trying to grow us spiritually. Maybe he's trying to deepen our devotional life. Maybe he's trying to prepare us for an assignment or our purpose. Maybe he recognizes that, that we are still very immature and he wants to mature us. Or maybe he's trying to address some character flaw that continues to plague us. Or maybe, brothers and sisters, he's just simply trying to save us. But whatever it is, it's for your conviction, not confusion. Because just like with the widow woman, God wants to nourish us spiritually and sometimes just blessing us isn't enough. You see, the widow woman saw the hand of God move every day. She saw a miracle of God every day. 
every meal she prepared, she knew undoubtedly that it was a blessing from God as the jar of oil and container of flour never ran out. But brothers and sisters, that is not what brought her to faith and conviction. It wasn't until her son died. You see, every day they were on the mountaintop as she prepared meal after meal, day after day as God blessed them. But it wasn't until she experienced the valley when her son died and God answering the prayers of Elijah and raising him from death to life that she truly had faith and believed Elijah's God was the true and living God. Understanding all of this, brothers and sisters, here's what I need you to get. Somebody needs to tweet this. Maybe post this. Don't waste your valleys. Let me say that again. Don't waste your valleys. The valley is where she found her faith and belief that God is real. You see, our truest and oftentimes deepest revelations of God come in the valley. But the problem is that too often we miss what God is doing because when we're in the valley, we're too busy looking for a way out when we ought to be looking for a way up. Trying to connect with a higher power. So don't waste your valleys. No matter what you're going through right now, don't waste your valley. As a matter of fact, it's the things we learn and experience in the valley that make the mountaintop sweeter. Imagine, brothers and sisters, how the widow woman will feel on the next day uh, as she goes uh, to prepare the morning meal uh, and she can hear the sound uh, of her son laughing and playing again in the distance. Uh, it's not a new sound. Uh, she's used to hearing it, uh, but imagine how much different it sounds uh, and means to her uh, after what she just encountered uh, the day before uh, when her child was dead uh, and she thought that she would never see him or hear his voice again. It's because it's our experiences in the valley that make the mountaintop sweeter. And so as this chapter, this story, this film comes uh, to its conclusion, uh, I guess we did end up with a good ending. Uh, even though scene three uh, started off pretty rocky, uh, it started off confusing. Uh, yet as always, this director, uh, the creator of this story, uh, knew what he was doing. Uh, he knew where he was going uh, and what he was trying to accomplish. Uh, and the good news today is is that uh, no matter what's happening in your story, uh, no matter what scene you're in, uh, the director of this story uh, is the same director of your story. Uh, he's the creator of your story uh, and he knows what he's doing. Uh, he knows uh, where he's going uh, and he knows what he's trying to accomplish in your life. Uh, so I'll say it again, brothers and sisters. Uh, don't waste your valleys. Uh, don't lose your faith uh, in the midst of the confusion. Uh, but understand today that your circumstance uh, was not created for confusion, uh, but it was created for conviction uh, because you were created for salvation. Uh, I'm reminded of a story uh, of a man who had just lost his family uh, to a tragic fire and had fallen into the depths of a deep and dark depression uh, who happened to be walking down uh, a city street uh, and he came upon a construction crew uh, that was erecting a new church. Uh, he stopped to watch them as they worked. Uh, as he watched, he observed uh, a worker who was busy uh, carving a triangle uh, out of stone uh, with a chisel and a hammer. Uh, stepping closer, he asked uh, the stone cutter, what was he carving? Uh, the worker pointed uh, to the steeple uh, up 
at the church and said, uh, do you see that small opening up there near the steeple? Uh, he said, well, uh, I'm carving this stone down here so that it will fit in up there. Uh, understand, brothers and sisters, today uh, that the valley you're in right now uh, is God's way of carving you down here so that you'll fit in up there. Uh, and I'm through, but I don't know about you, uh, but all I want to do uh, is be able to fit in up there. The songwriter says, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more and the morning breaks eternal bright and fair, when the saved of earth shall gather over on the other shore and the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. I can't wait to get there because when we get there, There'll be no more valleys, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more sickness, no more backbiting, no more bills, and no more disease. When we get there, there'll be no more pandemics, no more heart attacks, no more strokes, no more cancer, no more diabetes, no more aneurysms, no more Alzheimer's, no more dementia. But when we get there, there'll be no more stress, no more brokenness, no more scars, no more suicide, no more debt, no more violence, no more wars, and no more fighting, no more backbiting, and no more sleepless nights. There'll be no more medicine, and no more jealousy. When we get there, there'll be no more racism, and no more sexism, and no more classism, and no more injustice, and no more inequality, and no more death. But when we get there, what a day of rejoicing that will be. Because when we get there, every day will be sweeter than the day before. Every day will be a happy day. Every day will be a joyous day. Every day will be a peaceful day. Every day will be a stress-free day. Every day will be a lovely day. Every day will be a hallelujah good day. We'll run and never get tired. We'll live forever and never get old. We'll be reunited with our loved ones. I'm going to see my grandmother again. Shane, you're going to see your mother again. Somebody Somebody's gonna see their child again. Somebody's gonna see their husband again. Somebody's gonna see their wife again. Somebody's gonna see their mother again. Somebody's gonna see their father again. Somebody's gonna see their sister again. Somebody's gonna see their brother again. Somebody's gonna see their best friend again. But most of all, and best of all, we'll see King Jesus. Hallelujah. I can't wait to see my Jesus. I can't wait to see the man who bore my sins upon the cross. Hallelujah in this place. Ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? I said, ain't he all right? Hallelujah. I can't wait to see my Lord. Ball of confusion. Some 
stuff we're going through is confusing. Am I right or wrong? But Elijah. Didn't lose faith. In the midst of the confusion. And the circumstance was not created for confusion. But for conviction. And what that means, brothers and sisters, remember. Our theme is designated survivor. From the very beginning, it was always designed and designated for them to survive. What you're going through is designated for you to survive. But even though it's designated for you to survive, doesn't mean that sometimes along the way, doesn't mean you're not going to experience some confusion. Even though it was always designed and designated that they would survive, yet that circumstance was very confusion. It made no sense. God you stepped in and provided so we wouldn't die, starve to death, just to turn around and let him die? It didn't make sense. But when you understand that it wasn't created for confusion, what you're going through may be confusing, but it wasn't created for confusion. That's why we got to be like Elijah and not lose faith in the midst of the confusion. Because what you're going through was created for conviction. There's some stuff that you're going through right now. I experience that the only real purpose for it at the end of the day is because God is trying to bring me closer to him. God is trying to keep me saved. Don't miss that. Even along this Christian journey, been in the church all my life, and I still need God to keep me saved. And when, because I understand all this, in spite of what I don't, I don't like going through stuff, but I appreciate the fact that, that I know and understand God is allowing me to experience it in my life because he's trying to keep me. And when we understand it this way, brothers and sisters, let's not waste our valleys. And the goal is is, is not always looking for a way out, but looking for a way up. God, what are you teaching me? God, what are you showing me? God, where are you taking me? How are you growing me? Through this season, listen, the trials God allows to come our way are never meant to last forever. But as I've said before, the reason why some of us have extended stays in our valleys is because we're still too busy trying to look for a way out when we need to be looking for a way up. How to connect. What are you teaching me? What are you showing me? How are you growing me? How are you building me, God? How are you changing me? How are you healing me? How are you fixing me? Does it make sense? So my appeal is simple, brothers and sisters. Two things, and I'm going to invite you to stand. And say, God, help me from this day forward to understand. Help me from this day forward not to lose faith in the midst of the confusion. And help me to understand from this day forward that a lot of what I'm going through wasn't created for confusion, confusion. But it was designed for conviction. 
that is the circumstance that the widow woman need to go through, experience, to finally get her to the place where she believed and recognized, Elijah, you are a prophet, and your God is the true God. If that's you today, I want you to stand with me now. You're saying, God, help me not to lose faith in the midst of the confusion. And to know that what I'm going through right now, it wasn't created for confusion, but conviction. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm thankful. And elders, if you can join me now. I'm thankful that God is willing to do what he has to to save me. Anybody else thankful for that today? I'm thankful that he hasn't given up on me yet. I could imagine God sometimes just like, is he doing that? Is he? Is she doing that again? He's still stuck on that. But he's long suffering because he doesn't want any to perish. Isn't that good news today? And so you're standing now in acknowledgement, God, I don't want to lose my faith in the midst of the confusion. And God, from this day forward, help me to understand that what I'm going through, it wasn't created for confusion, but conviction. And maybe there's someone who's standing now, maybe you're kneeling, you're still seated, but you understand and receive this word today. But as... I've been speaking as the praise team was singing and worshiping. And, and, and at some point in this service today, God, God touched your heart. And it was all leading up to this moment. And he's saying for you, my child, you'll never truly understand the confusion until you surrender all to me. Maybe you're here today, and maybe you've been thinking about it. Maybe you've been struggling with it. Maybe you did it when you were a child, and, but you never were serious about it. But, but the Holy Spirit has convicted you on this day that now was the time to start anew, to start for the first time. And saying, as I'm trying to come out of the confusion, it starts with me giving my life to Jesus Christ. I know I need to be baptized. I know I may need Bible studies, whatever it is. But on this day, you're going to say, God, I, I, I surrender all to you. We have elders who are in the aisles and all over. They have a card that we want you to fill out. Letting us know your decision. Whoever you are, just raise your hand right now before we pray. Just raise your hand nice and high. Raise your hand. raise it before we close in prayer at this time let's raise it nice and high so we can acknowledge you let's raise it let's bow our heads Father we thank you for being an amazing God we thank you for being our God we thank you for being a patient God we thank you, God, for this reminder as we continue in this designated survivor series that the stuff we're going through, it wasn't created for confusion, but conviction. And because of that, God, we're asking and standing, affirming all together, God, that we're asking in need of you and your power to help us from this day forward, God, to not lose our faith in the midst of the confusion. You see everyone who's standing and responding now. Some who are kneeling. But we thank you God. And we pray God from this day forward. That as we walk with you. That when we experience our valleys in life. As Elijah and the widow woman are in this valley now. That we won't continue to always. Look for a way out. But more importantly, God, to look for a way up. 
so that we can see and connect with you and know exactly, God, how you're moving and what you're doing in our lives. And God, even from this day forward, as we recommit and stand, God, we acknowledge the fact that there's some stuff we go through that it may not even have been your ideal or desire for us to go through it. But we acknowledge, God, the bad decisions and bad choices that we make that put ourselves in precarious situations. But we thank you, God, that even in the midst of that foolishness, that you still work it out for our good. But God, we pray even along those lines that God, that you'll give us the strength to walk hand in hand with you. To limit God creating our own personal valleys. But that the valleys we experience from this day forward, God, are only the valleys that you allow to pass our way because you're trying to lead us to conviction. We thank you and we pray this prayer now in Jesus' name. The church said amen, amen, and amen. the name of Jesus with you.
chance to meet with the pastor right here up front. Don't leave. Meet. It will not be long. Trust that you will be reminded. We thank you for the message which served as a reminder of who you are. The I am that I am. The Alpha and the Omega. All things begin with you and all things end with you. The one who has never lost a battle. As we listen mighty God, didn't our heart burn within us. We are truly grateful to have had the privilege of sitting at your feet and basking in your glory. We present ourselves into the hands of him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us justified before his father's throne with exceeding joy. To you, the only wise God, Jesus Christ, our Savior, and the Holy Spirit, our Comforter, be glory, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. Amen and amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. We pray that as God knocked on the doors to your heart, you opened up and received him. If you were blessed by the content, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter at CWCSDA. We look forward to worshiping together with you at our next broadcast. Remember to stay safe and God loves you. Have a blessed week.